This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice. And we are, come on, glad in it. What a joy. Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you to our young people. Uh, we're delighted to have in uh, dress today the Divine Nine. We're glad to have you. I noticed that you led worship together in um, Darren Williams. Um, you can go ahead and drape the chair uh, uh, there. <laughs> drape the chair. Make sure. Even if it don't stay, we now the reason why I brought it out <clears throat> is because uh, T said, uh, uh, you know, did we hear it wrong? I mean, uh, they they had, you know, they had different leaders in worship, and no one mentioned our name. <clears throat> You are because <laughs> we're glad to have you here today. What a joy. Praise God for your presence. This is an exciting weekend, isn't it? For you to celebrate your day and Dr. King's birthday. And the one word that sums up both experience, both experiences would be service. While you're standing, if you would take God's word, there is an anatomy of service tucked away in the scripture in the Gospel of John chapter 13. That reminds us that first of all, we are servants of all. Commencing at verse 1 in chapter 13 of the Gospel of John in concluding at verse 5. This is the word of God. Yes, God. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> John Nisbet had a runaway bestseller in the middle of the 1990s entitled Megatrends, where, like Future Shock 20 years or so earlier, had predicted what would be taking place on the American horizon or the global scheme. And one of the <clears throat> principles or tenets that Nisbet said that would happen in America is that we would become a service economy. He probably had read John chapter 13 because that's the one thing that Jesus re-emphasized throughout his entire ministry is that we would become a service-oriented people if we have really been baptized in the spirit of Jesus Christ. I just finished a week of readings of different literature, novels, short stories, poetry, spiritual biographies, essays. And I noticed that in the biographical readings, as it was designated to focus in on a particular subject of someone's life, that it tried to give a whole picture of a person. John's gospel is not a biography, but when you read it, you notice something that's peculiar. that in chapter 13 to chapter 19, one half of the book is dedicated to <laughs> the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. Imagine reading a biography of somebody's life and they could condense it to the last 24 hours. I haven't read one like that yet. The first 12 chapters of John is dedicated to the public ministry of Jesus. This is where he is on boats teaching and on hillsides instructing. He's going from village to village, house to house, hamlet to hamlet, in his public discourses for the people to know this is God's vision for the world. But in John 13 to chapter 19, are the private teachings of Jesus, these long discourses that you come across 
You can read them at your own leisure. Excluding chapters 20 and 21 is designated for the particular hours of his last time on planet Earth. In doing that, when you start reading it, you come to this story that I ask you to open your Bibles to as they were preparing to celebrate the Passover. The first star will appear, and that will be the beginning of the festival. And it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that his hour had come for him to leave the world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This is the word of God. And so we're in the upper room now. And Jesus is about to do what he's always done, and he's going to give them a parabolic illustration, a lived experience of what service looks like. And you've read how John recorded what took place. And when you read it, there are reactions on how do I serve. There are some people who are anxious about service. They're anxious primarily because they say, look, uh, I don't want anybody to take advantage of me, mistreat me, think that they can put me down, and so they shy away from service. <laughs> some are cynical about service. Let somebody else do it. If they want to get it done. And still, there are others who are, have ulterior motives about service. What can I get out of it? How will it benefit me? And so Jesus comes along and he gives this illustration to help us understand how service works. He says, look, authentic service ignores arguments about greatness. It doesn't spend its time worrying about anxieties and cynicisms and ulterior motives. It ignores a whole bit of greatness. You see, when you read John 13, you have to peep back and look over in places like Luke 22, where there's this big discussion that takes place about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And the disciples have been discussing this issue back and forth. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to sit closest to Jesus at the Passover? Now, if you are scarcely conversant with the scripture, you are probably saying, well, what are they arguing about greatness? They didn't have nothing in the first place. <laughs> they lived in between the land and a tiny sea. Foxes had holes, birds of air had nests. And the person that they followed, an itinerant, penniless preacher, Jesus, had nowhere to lay his head. So what were they debating about when it came to the subject of who was going to be great? And Jesus caught the altitude of their attitudes as they were discussing this whole issue about greatness. In fact, it sounds more like they were childish, doesn't it? Imagine this morning we come to church and two preachers or two church leaders or two ushers or two people that work with our children and you are going back and forth about the whole issue of greatness. Yeah, it would be kind of childish for them to be going back and forth, I think. Who's going to be the greatest, you know? I could tell you of an actual event in the life of our church is too close, and if I started telling it, those of you who are active, you would know who these people are. 
who literally had a falling out about where they were going to sit. Childish. And Jesus saw this kind of behavior of childishness and says, what are they debating about? Some of you may remember the book that was published some years ago now, The Book of Lists. And what it is, it's, uh, it's, kind of, it's engaging, it's entertaining, but it talks about lists. That is, who's going to make the top lists? These anecdotes and narratives and these different stories that are told. And so it talks about who makes the list. Who makes the list as the most popular person? Who's the list of the sexiest human being? The wealthiest person? The 500 companies that make the list as the most prodigious companies in America or globally? Making the list. I was talking to my researcher, TikTok, the other night. And, <laughs> and they had a list. Just like that old book of lists, it had a list of celebrities and entertainers, and they summed up their value on dollars and cents. You see, true greatness can't be measured by secular tools. It boils down to how will you be remembered? How will people talk about you when you're no longer in the room? Will you make the world better than the way you found it? As if that's what the church is engaged in. That's what you and you and you and you and you are engaged in. To belong to a community that says we gather to make the world a better place than the way we found it and to improve and build on what has already been left for us. I was at a reading retreat and we stayed on the Lutheran campground and when their churches started closing pandemically, they would sell their buildings and then they would buy lands and then they would build retreat centers or expand on them. And so I, along with a group of students, one of my colleagues, we were there and we were reading on these grounds. And I said, I remember in the 70s when E. Stanley Branch, he was the pastor of Fort Missionary Baptist Church in Third Ward presented a vision to the Independent District Association, and he had mapped out and planned because Branch had been exposed beyond what most preachers would have been exposed in those days. And he laid out the plan and raised the money to build a campground. The association churches went to the campground all of its beginnings. And when our churches started growing and we were raising more money, we didn't go to the campground, we went to Trinity Pines. I sat in that Lutheran campground and I drove yesterday coming back from a funeral through Trinity and I said, what will the church leave that our children will be able to tangibly point to other than a church building? We built colleges, but we're closing them down. And there's a lot of money in this room this morning. I know some of you rich, because I know you. And we can't leave all of our money at the car dealership. And Jesus saw that. And he said, look at them arguing over who's the greatest.
So Jesus wanted to abolish this attitude, and how did he do it? Look at now the story that we read. He got rid of it by avoiding the usual excuses that we use when it comes to why I can't serve. You see, in the upper room, there was a basin and a towel, and this was the tools used to wash the filth and dung and the refuse from the sandals of the disciples that would come to dinner. And no one had to tell them to do it. You knew that this was part of the service, that you wash each other's feet. You get the filth off before we engaged into the celebration. And nobody moved. The funk of stench was pugnant in the room. And Jesus wanted to just know how long are they going to smell stuff <laughs> and never wash their feet. Because that's what you're supposed to do. You don't need an invitation to do that. That's what you're supposed to do. And nobody got up to do it. He said, is this the same group that's been arguing about who's the greatest and where they're going to sit in the kingdom? And here they are where they could act out what they want to be and, and nobody moves. Mm. And nobody did a thing. And so Jesus did the only thing that you're supposed to do at a time like this, and that is he didn't let what was happening in the room prevent him from serving. He gets up from the table. God, very God, who they had been with for three and a half years and who he had been teaching them and training them for three and a half years on what it looks like to be a servant. And Jesus didn't just teach it, he was the ocular demonstration of it. When somebody was sick, he went to their healing. When somebody was broken, he mended them. When somebody was crying, he wiped their tears away. When somebody was lonely, he stood next to them. When people were grieving, he sat in the seat with them. And now it's their time. And now they don't know what to do. Jesus didn't say a word. I guess he didn't have to because the word was flesh. And he got up when nobody else would get up. When Mississippian voices was hushed, Fannie Lou Hamer spoke. When America tried to turn its face in the face of lynchings, Ida B. Wells wrote about it. When SNCC needed a leader, Ella Baker stuck up. God always has a servant that will stand up at the right time to do something when nobody else will move. Mm. Jesus got up in spite of the prerogative that he lived under. You see, the hour, you read it, had come now. It's time to go back to where he had come from. And so Jesus lived under a strange prerogative. The prerogative was that he is now preparing to return back to the Father. But he cannot leave the kingdom in the hands of people who have their sights on seats only. And so in the prerogative, he says... I have to postpone prerogative or keep prerogative before me, but I have to serve at the same time. I have to have prerogative. I'm going back to the Father. I know that, that just, I'm just an hour or two away from humiliation and from abuse and crucifixion. I understand that, but I got to deal with what's in front of me right now because if this is what the church is going to look like, we'll never get anything done if folk just want to see where they can sit. Mm. 
And so Jesus, in the middle of prerogative, and you know the prerogatives, when you read in John 5, you come down to verse 22, I think around verse 27, it talks about the prerogative of life and the prerogative of his judgment and the prerogative of his authority. In the middle of all of that, God, very God, who becomes flesh, gets up from the table and takes off his outer garments. They didn't even see it. Because they were too busy eyeing the seat. And he got up and walked over to get the towel and the water basin. He did. And he served God in spite of distractions. It was one big distraction in the room. The devil was at dinner. Now you don't have to be a New Testament scholar to have fun interpreting that because what's one of the most sacred moments in your life? At the table. And the one time you don't want the devil, the devil in the house or if he's in the house, don't come to the kitchen. Because that's the sacred space. That's where we talk. That's where we engage one another. But now... There's a big distraction there. So you got disciples that want to look at seats. You got the devil in the house. And Jesus says, I got to serve. And I got to do it now. There's a line in chapter 13. You probably see it if you still have your Bible open where it says, because my time has come. For those of you that like studying the scripture, underline that because that line now answers the first time he used those words in John chapter 2 when at a wedding in Cana and his mother said, do something. And Jesus said, well, they, 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 they got their BYOB, don't they? they <laughs> said, yeah, but it's run out. And you know what Jesus said to his mama? My time has not come. Chapter 5. A man at the pool of Bethesda, he can't move 38 years. Do something, Jesus, do something. You know what he said? My time hasn't come. Chapter 8, chapter 6. His brother asked him, come on with us. He said, my time has not come. Chapter 8, after giving forgiveness to a woman who is life is just ruined and people are scandaling her. My time has not come. But in chapter 13, in the last hour of his life, he says, my time is at hand. This morning, some of you, you don't know what time it is. Let me see if I can bring it closer. You look good. You wear life well. But that's no guarantee that you or I are going to get up in the morning. Our time is at hand. Our time is at hand. And you use that time the best way that you can. I'm just about done now. One last thing happens here when you look at these verses where Jesus now is getting up to gird himself. He just simply, and I'm through, he takes the initiative. He just gets up when nobody else will. He takes the initiative. That's all I want you to know, to wash the feet of the disciples. And the way he does it is this. He gets up, walks across the room. He doesn't say a word. He strips down to his linen loincloth. And now he is in the garments, not of a servant, but a sub-slave. I got a room full of smart people this morning. Sub slave, that is lower than the slave. <laughs> and Jesus 
positions himself lower than the slave. Doesn't say a word. He just grabs the nasty, manured, covered, funky feet of his disciples. And he washes it. And he takes the initiative when nobody else will. A pastor in North Texas some years ago, he had a strange habit at 105. The 105 train would come past his church. He'd go out, and when he would hear the whistle sound, he'd go out and stand on the tracks, looking. Then when he saw the train coming, then he'd get off the track and look at the train Pass by. Now, you may have well said, if you saw me doing that. <laughs> and uh, that's, what his, that's what his members did. And they just politely, you know, brother pastor, you know, what's wrong? And he said, oh, nothing. It, I, it's just a habit I have during the day when I'm here that when the 105 is coming, I stand on the track. When I see it, you know, in the distance, I get off the track, just watch it go by. Why is that? Well, you know, I just like to see something come through town that I don't have to move myself. <laughs> 